and specifications while designing IC demo boards and data sheet application notes. Mark has five patents and has written over 11 technical articles in multiple electronic publications. Mark, thank you so much for joining us today. All right, well, it's nice to be here. Hello, everyone. Let's get started. The motivation for this presentation is switching loss is often a dominant loss. Unfortunately, switching loss is often poorly understood. Dead time plays a major role in hard switching losses. For this discussion, we have some assumptions. We'll be looking at a hard switching buck converter with a synchronous rectifier, sufficient dead time for the sync rectifier full body diode commutation, negligible stray inductance, and negligible RDS on loss. Let's look at some typical FET parasitics. The dominant parasitics are capacitance. The capacitors are typically identified as CISSS, CRSS, and COSS. They are often written in terms of gate to source capacitance, otherwise known as CGS, gate to drain capacitance, CGD, and the drain to source capacitance, CDS. We will also need to consider the parasitics of the body diode function, which has a forward voltage drop of VS2. Silicon MOSFETs have a body diode with the minority carriers, which creates reverse recovery charge, QRR. Let's look at the operation of a buck converter with a synchronous rectifier. S1 is on the high side, and the synchronous rectifier S2 is on the low side. S1 is on with a duty cycle feeding an inductor that pulls a constant average current. This is what we normally consider to be called transition losses or switching losses. However, we're also going to be talking about the dead time losses highlighted here in the body diode, uh, when the body diode conducts. <clears throat> Let's take a look at the switching loss of the high side FETs, S1. Shown here are typical waveforms. The blue S1 command is the control signal with the resulting red VGS gate voltage. Input charge effects. CISS has a direct effect on transition speed and faster transition equals lower switching losses. When we compare GAN FETs with silicon MOSFETs, EGAN FETs have very low input capacitance, CISS, switch faster, have lower transition loss. We are about switching loss on the sync. What about switching loss on the synchronous rectifier FET S2? Shown is the typical waveforms for the synchronous rectifier. The switch node commutation is driven by the inductor all the way into full body diode conduction. In other words, it's a soft switch. Notice the FET CISS does not have any effect in the switching in any way. The soft switching means there are no hard transition losses. Allowing enough dead time for body diode conduction prevents shoot through between S1 and S2 and maximize efficiency. However, dead time creates losses with the equation shown. Notice the forward, body, uh, the forward body diode conduction results in a negative diode voltage drop in waveform VS2. Notice the dead time has a multiplying effect on the power loss. Comparing EGAN FETs with silicon MOSFETs, EGAN FETs have a higher forward diode voltage. This would lead one to assume that would result in a higher power losses than a MOSFET. Except that as we will find out in reality, this is not true. To understand why EGAN FETs are not necessarily have higher dead time losses than MOSFETs, we need to take a look, closer look at the output parasitics. First, we'll look at the output capacitance COSS. When we turn on S1, we discharge the store energy on COSS1, and that energy is lost. Shown is the common EOSS energy loss equation used by some engineers. 
The problem with using this equation, in reality, COSS is not a fixed value. It is just a function of VDS. COS is not linear. Since COS is not linear, you're left with the question of what COS value do you use? What about COSS2? We had stated the switch S2 doesn't have any switching loss. However, if one puts a large capacitor in parallel with COSS2, it's going to severely disrupt the operation of the converter. So obviously it has an effect. So what do we do about the nonlinear capacitance? Let's go back to basics. Capacitors store charge Q and they store energy E. These terms can be written in the form of an integral formula where QSS is a function of capacitance and VDS. EOSS is a function of capacitance and VDS. Note the equations are not the same, but now accurate values can be calculated. Now we can compute the time-related energy and uh, time-related and energy-related equivalent capacitance by saying, what capacitance would I need to get a particular QSS? And what capacitance would I need to get a particular EOSS? These capacitor values are not identical unless the capacitor is a linear capacitor. Let's take a look at COSS capacitance when S1 turns on. The top set of waveforms is for the high side switch S1. The bottom side set of waveforms is for the low side switch S2. Let's turn on S1. We discharge the energy in the top switch, which we will call ESSS1. But happening at the same time is the switch node voltage is rising, charging COSS2. That charge comes from the bus voltage, which is calculates out to V bus times QSS2. At the end of the turn on interval, we have energy stored on COSS2, which will be called EOSS2. We can now compute the total energy loss during the S1 due to capacitive effects. The energy eon is equal to EOSS1, which is lost when we discharge the first capacitor, plus V bus times QSS2, which is the energy need to charge COSS2 during the turn on interval, plus EOSS2, which is the final charge on COS2 and the, at the end of the turn on interval. Now let's look at the capacitance when we turn S1 off. The inductor wants to pull current from charge COSS2, which is connected to ground, discharging COSS2. At the same time, the inductor also wants to pull current from the discharge COSS1, which is connected to VBUS, charging COSS1. Since all the energy is pulled by the inductor, the net turnoff energy lost by the capacitance is zero. So we have a COS energy loss summary. <clears throat> COS energy losses per switching cycle is tied to the turn on switching event with the equation shown. If the FET switches are identical part numbers, then EOSS1 and EOSS2 are identical, canceling each other out. This simplifies the equation, leaving Eon equal to V bus times QOSS. It should be noted that EGAN FETs typically have lower COSS than a MOSFET, allowing it to switch more efficiently. Now let's look at reverse recovery, which occurs when we have a body diode that's a PN junction. We start with a synchronous rectifier S2 in the on state with the inductor current flowing through the device. We turn, on, turn off S2. This forces the inductor current to commutate to the body diode of S2 for the duration of the dead time. Next, we turn on S1. S1 starts to supply current to the inductor and as S1 current rises, the current at S2 falls. A short time later, S1 fully satisfies meeting the entire inductor current. However, at the same time, current reverses and starts to flow through the body diode of S2 in the opposite direction it was flowing the moment before. But wait, this is a diode and should have blocked the current flow. This is the conduction phenomena of reverse recovery. When current reverses in the body diode is due to stored minority carry charge QR with, within the junction region of the body diode. The charge cannot instantly or easily be swept out of the diode. 
Until QRR charge is removed with time, the body diode does not turn off and continues to conduct current. The diode current can be quite high. Essentially, reverse recovery amounts to a shoot through condition. Eventually, the, the diode recovers. When all the charges are recombined or are swept out of the diode, uh, the diode turns off, stopping the current flow. However, during the reverse recovery period, we have additional energy loss due to QRR. The loss Q EQRR is equal to VBUS times QRR. Now we need to update our capacitive loss equation to show QRR charge. Again, if the FETs S1 and S2 are identical, that simplifies the equation, but it still needs to include QR charge loss. QR is a strong contributor to output switching loss. But in the case of EGAN FETs, QRR is zero. Let's compare EGAN FETs to silicon MOSFETs. Once again, EGAN FETs, QR is equal to zero. For silicon MOSFETs, QR reverse recovery only happens with a PN junction body diode. It is important to consider that QR is not actually a fixed value. It is not well characterized in typical data sheets, and there's no industry standard on how to measure it. MOSFET vendors will give you a number, but in reality, QRR worsens with higher temperatures as the current goes up, faster switching higher MOSFET voltage ratings, and with longer dead times. How does changing dead time have an effect on QRR? Let's look at, let's look at some typical waveforms. On the top are the high side switch waveforms. Zero nanoseconds is the time just after the bottom switch is turned off and we've established current flow through the diode. Looking at the top waveform, S1 VDS voltage is in green, which collapses when we turn S1 on. The resulting S1 current is in dark blue. S1 current rises to a very large peak value before finally collapsing and returning to the inductor current. The peak portion of this current is a sum of charging currents for both COSS2 and QRR. On the bottom of the waveforms, the S1 current has been broken up into two parts. We have the gray waveform shows QOSS during current, charging current. The cyan waveform shows S2's body diode QR charging current. Any positive current above the zero amp line is loss from total output charge. QoS loss is not a function of dead time being pure capacitive. QR, on the other hand, is getting both higher and longer as dead times increase, 10 nanoseconds, 20 nanoseconds, 30 nanoseconds. Why is QR alone a function of dead time loss? This involves a deeper dive into the diode structure. The top left graph shows charges within the body diode of the FET. The middle graph shows the top switch waveforms. The bottom graph shows the bottom switch waveforms. Returning to the top graph, we can see the two charge waveforms. QE is the charge injected to the diode region to support normal conduction. QM represents the surplus minority carrier charge deep in the junction region. At T equals zero nanoseconds, we've just turned off the rectifier switch and forced inductor current to start to flow in the body diode. QE builds immediately in order to support the inductor current. Q1 falls behind, injecting additional charge into the junction region that is stored. While the diode is conducting, we see both charges increase exponentially with time. If we make the dead time really long, eventually QM and QE will flatten out and reach a maximum. Now we turn S1 on and see that QE charge drops to zero. Inductor current has stopped flowing in the diode. However, QM is not zero and the charge has to decay exponentially, mostly due to recombination. 
Meanwhile, the diode can conduct reverse current until QM equals zero. So how does this affect the loss? If you look at the EGAN FETs, there is no reverse recovery. Loss is linearly a function of the dead time because loss is simply due to the reverse voltage drop. The longer the dead time, the more energy is dissipated. With a PN body diode inside a MOSFET, there's a sharp increase in loss due to QR that tapers off. Starting at dead time of zero, dead time of zero nanoseconds, we can plot QRR loss of the MOSFET versus forward drop loss of the EGAN FET. At low dead times, the EGAN FET has lower losses. We want proof? We've done some, done some GAN versus MOSFET experiments using 80 volt related rated parts. We designed a special 50 millimeter by 50 millimeter buck converter board for each FET tested. They have identical layout as close as possible subject to the limits of the FET footprint, footprint differences. Each board was operated at 48 to 12 volts, 300 kilohertz, using the same 4.7 inductor and output capacitors. Since we could not have a true zero nanosecond dead time condition without shoot through issues, we started with a five nanosecond condition and called this a P baseline. We made this loss VR zero by subtracting it from all measurements. We start adding five nanoseconds to the total dead time and measure total losses. This is repeated until the dead times have been measured for all FETs. Dead time losses then calculated the equation shown. Finally, we did separate experiments for varying dead times, but only varied the rising edge or the falling edge, keeping the other constant. The graph shows S1 turn on dead time results with a fixed turn off dead time of 20 nanoseconds. We use three different 80 volt FETs, two MOSFETs shown in black and red, and one EGAN FET shown in blue. Results were plotted for 10 amps, 20 amps, and 30 amps. Looking at the small dotted lines for the 10 amp load condition, the silicon MOSFET losses are quite low on the order of a watt, not too far away from the GAN FET results. However, at 20 amps, the dashed line, or 30 amps, the solid line, we see a sharp increase in losses that get worse and worse as you increase the dead time. Eventually, the MOSFET losses start to level off, but the MOSFET losses are now two to three times the loss of the GAN FET approaching six watts. Now let's look at S1 turn off dead time with turn on dead time fixed at 20 nanoseconds, the exact opposite condition before. We got the same currents, same scales on both X and Y axis as the previous graph. Notice we don't have any reverse recovery losses. The inductor is driving the switch node. Silicon MOSFETs do perform better here, but that's because they have a lower voltage drop on their body diode than EGAN FETs. The GAN FET looks almost identical to their turn on dead time losses because the losses are both cases due to voltage drop only. If you were to sum both turn on and turn off dead time losses together, the EGAN FET wins with lower dead time losses overall. Dead time summary. Dead time losses play a large role in switching loss. The mechanism for dead time switching losses are body diode voltage drop, and reverse recovery in the case of silicon MOSFETs. We've shown that MOSFET QR losses can be uh, several times higher than the high reverse voltage drop losses of EGAN FETs. Dead time management can be critical for MOSFETs. It is harder to manage dead time in silicon MOSFETs than EGAN FETs. Okay. Okay, thank you, Mark. So now we're going to get started answering some of the questions that came in um, during the presentation. And you can still continue to put your questions into the Q&A box. Um, we'll, we'll be here to answer them. So the first question we got was um, the COSS loss for half bridge topology is zero. What if there is only one switch instead of two switch? What is the loss in case of using only a single GAN as compared to silicon MOSFET? Well, I'd have to understand the topology, but basically if you have a charge across the FET when it's off and then you turn on the FET, 
clearly the C loss of the capacitance charge that's on the output of that FET will be lost inside the FET. So that's, that will become a loss. Um, if the FET is no voltage drop across it when it's turned on, then there's not going to be any energy loss. So it really comes down to the state of the, the voltage across the FET at the time that you turn the FET on. Um, this is a good question. Is COSS modeled in the EPC SPICE models? Yes, it is modeled in the EPC SPICE models. Okay. Um, why does the EGAN FET have zero QRR? That's a good question. And that's because there's actually no body diode. Now you look at our symbol and it looks like a regular MOSFET, but that diode is actually being a function of the FET. Uh, the, the FET itself, if you go back to the basics of how the FET works, when the gate is enhanced, as we know relative to the source, that turns on the FET. What most people don't know is if the gate is enhanced relative to the drain, that also turns on the FET. Now, since there's no body diode in the EGAN FET, that's exactly what happens. If you have, a, for instance, an asynchronous rectifier application and the inductor drives the drain of the synchronous rectifier below ground, at some point, the gate, which is off at zero volts, will allow the drain to go below ground. At some point, you will have a neck depth differential that positively enhances the gate relative to the drain. The FET will turn on. That forward voltage drop is a pretty much almost exactly the same as the VGS curve you would see for a turn on. So whatever voltage is needed to bias the FET to support the current, that will be the voltage drop that you get across the FET. Now, this happens with MOSFETs, but the, what, unfortunately, the parasitic PN junction diode gets in the way. The PN junction diode will conduct current before the drain and gate can be enhanced relative to each other. In other words, the feature that is in the GAN FET, which allows it to automatically turn on by the FET performing the virtual diode function, with the MOSFET, you're stuck with the PN junction diode taking care of that situation first with consequences. All right. The next question is, what is the reverse voltage drop across the EPC GAN FET and is this linear with the current flowing through it? Uh, yeah, it's, it's the same as the VGS curve. If you remember how a FET works, the gate voltage refers, uh, uh, it sets the transconductance level. So the higher the gate voltage, the higher the current can go on the drain. Well, that's exactly what happens when we're in our virtual diode mode. The drain voltage has to go negative relative to the gate, the same amount as it would be as if the gate voltage was being positive to the source for the same current. In other words, the VGS voltage is actually the same as the voltage drop of the diode mode. So if, for instance, if it took two volts to uh, turn on the FET uh, normally to support, let's say, 10 amps, then when you're in a diode mode, it's going to take a minus two volts on the drain to be able to support the same 10 amps in diode mode. So this question actually came in from somebody during when they were registering. It's not necessarily related, but maybe you can answer it. So in your opinion, will it be a big trend to co-package silicon-based gate drivers with E-mode low voltage GAN hemp for high power applications like greater than 500 watts? Well, it, I guess you have to just understand what package. If you're talking about a uh, module with discrete chips, uh, there's actually work to be going on with that. So combining a silicon driver with EGAN FETs is something that's being worked on. Uh, if you're talking about what we often refer to a Dr. GAN, which is a monolithic solution, we are down that path, but we're not as far as we'd like to be. We have a part, the EPC 2152, that kind of gives you a snapshot of where we are. We have a GAN FET driver driving GAN output FETs. It's all a monolithic uh, die. There's, it's not a multi-chip model, model um, module with bond wires jumping between the different uh, die. It is actually a monolithic that logic input to switching power output. So we are working in that direction to come up with a Dr. GAN. Uh, we're taking it in stages here, but we've got the basic half bridge with bootstrap input logic and uh, 
uh, um, onboard gate voltage regulation already incorporated into an IC. And we're adding more and more features to that. And that will be a wafer level chip scale uh, package, but uh, 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 other types of packaging are possible. Um, does EPC GAN have a dynamic resistance effect for losses? Yeah, if you're referring to dynamic RDS on, I believe. Dynamic RDS on is something that uh, EPC has worked hard and has identified the causes and solved them. Now, dynamic RDS on, you can never completely get rid of it, but once you know how to trigger it, you can design the FETs to move the dynamic RDS on out of the way of the operation of the FET. EPC has done that and contributed to working with, a, is it an IPC or JEDEC? I forget which one it is, but there's now a standard on how to manage your dynamic RDS on. EPC has taken its FETs and upgraded them and moved the dynamic RDS on so that that occurs when you're above, above the VDS max rating. In other words, for the norm, per the data sheet, if you stay within the data sheet uh, limits, you will not encounter dynamic RDS on to the level that you have a runaway resistance change. So dynamic RDS on has now been mastered in terms that it can be triggered, it can be diagnosed, we can design for it now, and we can make sure our FETs uh, move that problem out of the way. And I would just add, there's actually a ton of information about this on the website because we've done a lot of um, reliability work, as Mark mentioned, um, finding out the physics of failure and, and all, everything behind dynamic RDS on. And so on the website, if you go to um, design support reliability, you can find all the, um, the reliability reports and, and information that, that Mark is uh, talking about there. Um, okay, how do you compare between tuning of switching loss versus dead time loss? Uh, well, that uh, the switching loss, if you want most efficient switching, what you should allow the do allow the inductor to switch the node for you. So in case of a buck converter, you want to turn off the FET to allow the inductor to switch the switch node all the way into body diode conduction. Once you have established body diode conduction, there is no longer any purpose to continue to extend the dead time. And at that point, you can then turn on the uh, synchronous rectifier. If you turn on the synchronous rectifier before you've allowed the inductor to transition the switch node, that's gonna be hard switching on the bottom FET and you'll see an increase in losses. Uh, another question. Does the reverse recovery QR overshoot vary according to the charge across COSS? Uh, yes, it, uh, it does have effect on it. Uh, there's The problem with QR is there's so many variables involved in it. It's not one dominant over the other. Um, current has a major flow uh, rever uh, factor in it. The design of the FET also has a factor in it. The voltage rating, for instance, is a, it gets worse with a, a 100 volt FET than it is with a 20 volt FET. So um, yeah, it, it, it does have an effect. All right. Um, MOSFET data sheets usually provide QRR at a reasonable current 25C and a low DIDT. There is no dead time component in the specification. How do I know the real QRR to use in my calculation? That is a big challenge. And the data sheet manufacturers of MOSFET Center have not made it easy for you. What would have been nice is if they had a graph that plotted all the different conditions and so forth. But, be, but MOSFET manufacturers, since there's no standard, are free to choose the conditions that make their foot, uh, FET look the best that it can possibly be under for QRR. So in other words, they cherry pick. So you can't really compare QRs of two different MOSFETs that, that readily. If you have a single point, that doesn't tell you the whole thing. Again, as we've covered all the difference, the other factors that affect QRR, you really don't have a complete picture. It's, it's rather a complicated thing to look at because of all the variables. Uh, there are papers on QRR and it gets quite in depth of the different uh, physics of the, of the properties of the diode that come into play. So there's no, there's no easy answer to that question. The best thing is, Choose a part that doesn't have QRR. Does dead time for the GAN FETs need to be adjusted for temperature? No. Uh, the great thing about MOS, I mean GAN FETs, is that they're very temperature 
uh, uh, they're not sensitive to temperature. Uh, just to give you a point, <laughs> you can run our parts so hot, you can melt the solder underneath them and they'll still switch. Mm -hmm. Temperature is not a major parameter for EGAN FETs. The, uh, so that's, that's uh, it's much set less sensitive to those variables. This allows you to use a fixed dead time without worrying about temperature. So, and it also because the EGAN FET switches so fast compared to a MOSFET, you can use very low dead times on the order of 10 nanoseconds without a problem. Okay. How are the theoretical thermal models of EGAN validated with experimental measurement? And how are those measurements used for lifetime predictions? Well, that's a complicated question. I think we have some presentations on that. Don't we have a, I'm trying to think of the, um, the modeling. I know we have a uh, mechanical engineer, Assad, who's doing a lot of this paperwork and doing investigation. Um, yeah. And we're actually doing the thermal um, webinar in two weeks. So I think maybe Brian will cover some of that. Yeah, I'm hoping he'll cover some of that. Yeah. Okay. Um, is QRR equals zero true for GANFET even when the operating temperature or junction temperature is high? I think that's similar to. Yes, it is still zero. Yeah. Again, there is no PN junction diode in a GANFET. The FET itself is doing the switching. Okay. Uh, what is a good typical dead time to use with GANFETs? Uh, the, typically, I recommend 10 nanoseconds, but again, for efficiency, you have to look at your LC output stage and you want to make sure that you, uh, if you're looking for maximum efficiency, that you let the inductor, uh, the zero voltage switch the switch node. So you should extend it based on your actual operating conditions. What we're saying 10 nanoseconds, we're just saying that from a FET perspective alone, not worrying about efficiency, the FETs themselves can, can use as low as 10 nanoseconds, even five nanoseconds. Um, getting, uh, there's some challenges when you get down there, you gotta make sure your gates are designed for GAN FETs. They have to have match propagation delay and they have to have a, a good dead time generating uh, system to make sure that the, um, those things come together. So the driver gets involved in terms of its errors and delay that in terms of what you could achieve in terms of dead time. But the FETs are very consistent, very fast in terms of switching. There's no, like, I think I can, I think it can. Oh, I'm gonna go. The little, you don't have the MOSFET, which has that little slow ramp in the beginning and then suddenly takes off that delay that we, we you don't see that in the GANFETs, which allows you to switch very quick, cleanly and there isn't a big variation in it. So 10 nanoseconds, if, if, you, uh, if the efficiency allows it, 10 nanoseconds. Otherwise you need to increase it based on your application to make sure you operate in the most efficient mode. Okay. The impact of COSS loss becomes worse when you consider the parasitic inductances. How much of a percentage ringing do the EBC GANFETs handle and are the parasitics provided in the data sheet? Well, I agree with you that, that the, the combination of the parasitic inductance with the output capacitance of the FETs generates the ringing, sets the ringing frequency. That's your LC uh, resonance. However, we greatly reduce the inductance to minimize the amount of resonant energy involved. If you look at our half bridge designs, we implement what's called inductance cancellation within the PCB artwork. The inductance cancellation ties to a very rigid structure of how you lay out the half bridge relative to the input capacitors. You have to use very small uh, package inductors, I mean capacitors, uh, for the bypassing. Not, not, you still need bulk capacitors, but they don't have to be near the half bridge. You just need very small capacitors with low package inductance near the half bridge for the inductance cancellation. What we're doing is we're running the return current uh, from the half bridge directly underneath the half bridge circuit, one layer down, not on the bottom layer, not some internal layers, but on way one layer down, and we're making the thickness of that layer about five mils. That's about the maximum thickness you need for about 100 volts, or minimum thickness, I should say. Um, that causes the currents to be equal and opposite flowing through the half bridge uh, when it's switching. 
that cancels the inductance in the power loop and greatly reduces the energy involved in the resonant ringing. So if you design the half bridge stage properly, you can control the ring without excessive energy being getting in the way. And finally, you can do a little bit of tuning of the gate resistors to finally settle it down to get almost a perfectly relatively clean switch sw switching cycle. Okay, so we've never had this happen in a webinar before, but someone raised their hand. So I'm going to allow them to talk and we'll see. Maybe they raised it by accident, but you are unmuted if you had a question or you're able to unmute. Oh, maybe it got raised by an error. Oh, now someone else wants to talk. We'll see. <laughs> Alex, you're unmuted if you wanted, if you had a question or you're able to talk if you have a question. Okay. We'll see if they chime in, but other, okay. So here's a question though from Alex. What are the capacitors that handle tens of amps having such a small size as shown on the reference boards? Well, those are capacitors. The small ones are only used for the switching edges. You still need a bulk capacitance for handling the uh, uh, output current for the load of the inductor. Uh, we just typically prominently place the small capacitors right next to the half bridge because again, for the low inductance cancellation, we typically deal with nano capacitors in the nanofarad range in 0603 or 0402 sizes we can, depending on the voltage and application. Uh, bigger capacitors and larger size packages uh, can be put in parallel on the other side. Um, the, the only thing, like I said, the only the half bridge only cares about the low inductance inductance cancellation. The bulk capacitance is more of a function of your circuit design and how much local energy you need to support the pulse of current going out to your inductor or whatever it is. Okay. Um, another question. Do you have any application notes related to this webinar? Uh, I'm sure we do. I can't think of off. I, I know we have some how to and probably some app notes i can't think of them off the top of my head right now um but we do have some uh discussion definitely uh on our website uh you can look it up under resources uh we have application notes and how to gan uh and there are discussions about switching stage and dead time and uh pcb layout and all those things are available um, does Miller ratio, Miller ratio play any crucial role for a change in switching loss? No, with GAN FETs, we, Miller is not the problem. Miller ratio is less than one. Uh, so switching speed is not a consequence of Miller. We have a different problem. Because our GAN FETs are so fast with FT values in the high multi gigahertz range, you're basically talking about parts that are RF power switches. Um, the thing that becomes a problem is what's called common source inductance. Uh, this has the same net effect as Miller capacitors in, the, in that it slows down the switching speed of the FET and can create oscillations. But the mechanism, instead of having a relationship to the drain, the mechanism has a relationship to the source. In this case, the source has a combination of gate and drain current flowing out of it. If you place an inductance, uh, this ductance could be PCB inductance, or if you have a current sense resistor on the source, or whatever, that all has, let's say, 50 nanohenries of uh, total inductance. If you run a half amp per nanosecond DIDT through that, you're going to have a five volt drop across that 50 nanohenries. In other words, you're going to have an instantaneous voltage drop across the printed circuit board trace on the source pin or the current sense resistor if there's one on the source pin, independent of the actual resistance. It's going to be inductively driven. Since you're shifting the source pin above ground, for instance, but the gate voltage is referenced to ground, that means the VGS voltage as seen by the FET collapses. So the higher the source pin bounces above ground, the less VGS voltage you get. It has a negative feedback on the FET. It causes it to go into a tr transconductance limit. Well, it's already in limiting, but it's, it, it causes to go further into transconductance limit and you can get an oscillation 
due to this LC ringing between the gate capacitance and the source inductance through that gate loop. But that causes the same in that effect of slowing down the uh, GAN FET, just like Miller capacitance that would do for a MOSFET. Uh, so careful printed circuit board layout. It's There's some simple rules about how to deal with this. Uh, there are gate drivers that actually help you make this easy to do by having a dedicated gate source return pin for the bottom side FET. Uh, independent of the ground. Uh, otherwise, you have to deal with it inside the layout. Uh, in our EPC 2152, which is the Dr. GAN, although it's not really a Dr. GAN, but it's our half bridge IC, we've done the Kelvin sensing of the gate return inside the die. And when we made that part, we got a significant speed improvement and efficiency just by making that critical connection, dealing with common source inductance, addressed inside the die so that the printed circuit board is not a factor. So the answer is it's not Miller capacitance, it's common source inductance. Uh, what is the character characteristic impedance of the bus then if the capacitance is a, on order of a few nanofarads l of dc bus in order of few picohenries of inductance is it even achievable well we don't want zero we need some capacitance there because it's part of the inductance cancellation loop so let, let me explain the uh what's happening here the small capacitors are involved with the uh, COSS output capacitors of the FETs. So as they're switching, as we discussed in this presentation, you can see COSS is being charged and discharged on these output FETs. And that energy has to come from your input bulk capacitors. If Since the switching is so fast, you need to have a low inductance source of this capacitance energy to satisfy that QRR, I mean, that QSS times VDS number. So uh, that's what the small capacitors are for. And so as you're switching, you can instantly uh, charge and discharge those capacitors. At the same time, the current flowing through the half bridge stage goes all the way to ground, comes back up to the capacitor, forming a loop. And that those sp spike concurrence that happen due to the capacitance switching flows underneath the bottom layer that goes equal but opposite currents. Uh, they cancel each other out and it cancels the inductance. So it has to be a tight, flat loop area. And you need this low inductance of parallel capacitors for that. Again, this is not the bulk capacitance you need for your application. This is purely the capacitance you need to address to get fast, efficient switching with the EGAN FETs. You need to put additional capacitors on there to get the low impedance you need for your output current. That's still something you need to do. So if you need to, no, you don't have to, but you can put an aluminum electrolytic in parallel with these ceramic caps. As long as the ceramic caps are handling the power stage and dealing with the inductance, your aluminum electrolytic could deal with uh, regulating the overall load impedance uh, of the, the supply rail relative to the output stage and supply the bulk current as you uh, locally as you expect the bulk capacitance to do. I was muted, sorry. How can EGAN be used in a push-pull configuration? Uh, I think you uh, push pull. I'm. Is, are we talking a half bridge or a full bridge? I'm not sure. Um, um, but uh, the EGAN FETs can be used in the same topology sockets as MOSFETs. So you, whatever topology that you use for uh, MOSFETs, whatever application, whatever, you can drop in a GAN FET in that socket. So there's no topology limits for EGAN FETs. They're, they're basically gate, source, and drain. The, the critical parts about uh, GAN FETs is how you uh, do the gate driver connection, how you lay out the gate driver to the GAN FET. And in case of half bridges, you need to have the bypass caps, the, low, high, the high frequency, low impedance bypass caps for the uh, half bridge stage. Why don't GAN gate drivers have adaptive dead time control? Uh, the, the great thing is, is that fixed dead time is, 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 need, is that's all it's needed with GANFETs. Again, temperature is not a variable that changes the dead time. So by uh, not having to adapt means we can use a simpler mode, mode of uh, dead time management. We can simply have uh, fixed timers involved in that. Um, 
There's nothing saying we can't use adaptive get dead time. And in fact, I would argue that we are eventually going to have something in our dark began that does that. But, uh, but the great thing about, unlike MOSFETs, GANFETs are very temperature stable in terms of their parasitic operating conditions, such that a slow fixed dead time is perfectly acceptable. Okay. All right. So I think we've answered all the open questions. If there are not any more, we will um, wrap up for today. Um, so thank you, Mark, and thank you everyone for attending the webinar. If you have any additional questions, please feel free to send them into info at epc 